Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm really glad you're here, and I hope you're very excited because <coughs> fire is really at an inflection point where I think we're going to see a whole major shift in interoperability. It's going to affect all of you in this room. I would really appreciate if in the course of this you consider filling out these questionnaires to help us with our fire roadmap. InterSystems considers this very important. We want your feedback because as we're building the product, we're really going to take into account your issues and concerns. Well, my name is Pat Jamison. I'm the product manager for Iris for Health. I've been involved in health informatics a long time, including uh, uh, time at Cerner, at Kaiser, and a number of startups. I'm going to give you the big picture of what's going on with fire and the changes that uh, have happened in the last uh, 12 months or so. My colleague, Max, is a sales engineer with two degrees, including a PhD in computer science. He's going to really give you what I'd call the customer perspective of what people are actually doing in the UK with fire, because I think the UK is actually a little bit ahead of the US. So here's our agenda for this afternoon. I'm going to give you a kind of a really super quickie review of FIRE. We're going to talk a little bit about what's driving FIRE adoption. Because all of us are going to need to be ready. There's just no doubt that FIRE is going to affect all of us here. I'm going to talk about some changes in FIRE and what the FIRE roadmap looks like ahead, at least in the next 12 months or so. And then I'm going to, uh, my colleague Max is going to give some great examples of how FIRE is actually being used by InterSystems customers. So what is FIRE? Probably most of you know the acronym stands for Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resources. But what makes FIRE really special today is that it's a modern API specification. We've been living with interoperability HL7 v2 that was really conceived roughly 40 years ago. And a lot has changed in the way computers can communicate. So FIRE is a RESTful specification. And what does that mean? Well, it means that it has a uniform interface Resources can be identified by their URLs, and the payload that you get back in a response is typically per, comes back in the form of XML or JSON. It has, it's a stateless type of API. None of the client's context is stored on the server side between requests. It's cacheable, so responses can be cached. The client and server have a clear separation. The client's not concerned with data storage. The server's not concerned with the user interface. So layered systems. So really, the client really can't tell exactly where the end server is. So how do you access data in Fire? Well, if you have a Fire server, there's a concept of a repository. So that repository has to expose an, a, a base address, an endpoint, that you can then reach out and communicate with. It also includes in that URL the type of resource that you're uh, communicating or trying to get data from. So those are collections of resources that have all the same type. And FIRE has a lot of different types, and we'll uh, explore some of these. The type must be a type that's defined in this FIRE specification. So you can't really make up your own types. You could extend types, but the types are those in the FIRE spec. And then you have an identifier. This shows a specific FIRE instance that manages or identifies the instance of that resource within the collection. If you look at the fire spec, 
There are over 100 resources representing wildly different types of content. So here's an example of one such resource, the patient resource, and I'm only giving a partial listing of that resource. You see that the resource is normative. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But notice the properties or fields of the resource. We see, like, for example, the identifier has a enumeration of either zero to many. So it's a, essentially an array. We have other uh, array properties, such as the human name, telecom. But the gender is either represented it's not uh, represented or there's only going to be one of them. And it's going to be coded to one of these specific enumerated values. Now there's a special thing that's kind of confusing. You see that question mark explanation point? It really means that pay attention to this field because it can change the whole meaning of this resource. So in this case is whether this patient's record is is in active use. And I think that really does make a difference, right? If you compare HL7V2 to FHIR, FHIR makes it easier to find and register extensions. Now, extensions are very common in interoperability. In HL7V2, we use Z segments to encode additional data to messages, or we could create entirely custom messages. Fire locks that down to a degree. Essentially, you can add different elements into the uh, base fire resources, but they must be identified with an extension URL, and they must have a value that is basically one of the base fire data types. So what are these data types that I'm talking about? There are a number of different major categories of data types. So we have primitive data types, general purpose data types, metadata types, and special purpose uh, data types. All of these types are well defined in the uh, FHIR specification. And one of the things that I really like uh, about what HL7 has done with FHIR it's done a great job of documenting this. So you could go to the FHIR website, and you really can get a very good description of these. So if you're interested in, for example, programming your own classes to incorporate these data types, it's, it's fairly simple to do based on the specification. It's, just, it's not that mysterious. It's a very good document that you should uh, take a look at. So now I'm going to go to the big picture. That's our little review of FHIR. So what about the history? Why, why FHIR? What's pushing this? So there was this little report back in April of 2015. It was commissioned by the Office of the National Coordinator, which you may have heard of. And basically, it came back with a suggestion and uh, research that Persons and entities were interfering with the exchange or use of electronic health records in, in ways that frustrated the goals of the High Tech Act. High Tech was what created all the meaningful use dollars that really jump started the EMR industry. And, but Congress essentially was feeling that it was not getting its money's worth, that people were frustrating some of the intent of all the wiring that took place with EMRs. So fast forward, what happened? Well, the ONC issued a proposed rule. It's not been finalized yet, but it probably will be, I suspect, by the end of the year. Through the 21st Century Cures Act, we have this proposed rule that is essentially opening up information sharing. So what's the purpose of the rule? It's to really increase innovation and competition. It's trying to give patients control or access, at the very least, to their own health information. 
and allow others to provide new tools to patients that allow for more choice in care and treatment. Innovation, I really think that FIRE is going to create a whole new ecosystem of startup companies that will be really uh, uh, exciting over the next several years. The rule also is going to reduce the burden and advance interoperability. By moving to this new standard uh, API, we're going to have the ability to exchange data in ways that we just simply can't do with CDA. And it's obviously going to promote patient access. It requires that patients have access to all of their electronic health information, both structured and unstructured, at no cost. So what will be exchanged initially with the proposed rule? Well, we have this U.S. Core Data for Interoperability, or U.S. CDI. And you can see this covers a lot of different areas. Assessment and plan of treatment, clinical notes, patient goals, medications, demographics, problems, procedures, the provenance, what we heard today, of you know, where does that data come from? vital signs, and a lot of other areas like lab. This is really, I think, a key to making, da uh, making data interoperable. To get it to a level of this granularity uh, for data exchange. And how is that information going to be exchanged? It's going to be exchanged through FHIR and specific fire resources, here uh, uh, pictured by ARCH, or the API Resource Collection and Health. And you could see the fire resources will be supporting that, U, uh, that US CDI uh, standard of uh, different clinical variables that will be exchanged. So fire is going to become the law of the land. It's going to require us to publish APIs and allow health information to be accessed and exchanged without special effort. That's the goal, and I truly believe that this is going to happen in the next few years. Through these e APIs, developers have to provide access to all data elements in this US CDI. And it must we must supply a publication of service-based URLs or endpoints to customers so that they can access uh, this data. So is it FHIR being used at all today? Well, EMR vendors have committed to the use of FHIR. So we see right now that the majority of major uh, EMRs support at least uh, the FHIR Release 2 standard, DTSU 2, and many are uh, at FHIR Release 3. Nevertheless, even though the, uh, the vendors themselves, a large percentage support FHIR, the actual use of FHIR in exchanging data in, uh, in the United States is probably much lower than the fi this figure suggests. So what's going on with FHIR in terms of how is the standard moving forward? Well, everyone has been waiting for FHIR to become normative. HL7 is a very consensus-driven, balloted-driven, and validating-driven organization. By validation, they want to see their standard used before they lock it down, and that means Locking it down means at least to get to the normative stage where, in practice, if you implement a standard that's normative, it won't break in the future. So where are we today? Only the patient and observation resources are normative as of FHIR R4, which was, came out in December of 2018. What is going to happen, though, is that many more resources will become uh, uh, normative. And in fact, 
The government has also contracted with a company called MITRE to test whether providers will be able to provide uh, access to that USCDI data in a fire form through the use of a tool called Inferno. What Inferno does is it validates whether your uh, fire server can produce the required uh, minimal uh, data set that's conformant to the 21st Century Cures Act. Certainly, InterSystems will produce in FireR4 a compliant version that will pass uh, the Inferno test. So, the bottom line is that we're all going to be changing. We're all going to be moving forward because we need to move to a modern standard of interoperability. Microsoft, as well as other large health IT vendors, sees Fire as a first-class data type, which I believe is certainly the, tr uh, the case. I think Fire will become essentially the universal data type for healthcare in the next 10 years. So how is this progressing? If you look at the release history, FHIR is a standard that's moving very rapidly, especially compared to HL7v2. First, it was released in September of 2014, but really we're seeing new major releases on about an 18-month interval. The next release we, sus we think is going to be available in October 2020, with Fire R5. And Fire R5, we think 20 to 25 resources will become normative in that time. So this is the maturity model. Fire goes through a drafting stage, then working groups, then real world implementations before it becomes normative. But once something has become normative, I think you can rely on it for production use. In general, everything is moving toward a normative status in FHIR, and I think we're going to see a lot of resources uh, coming in October 2020 that will become normative. So basically, the FHIR community is moving forward content to a formal normative status. It's doing a good job of supporting and publishing implementation guides that you could access today uh, through the FHIR website. Uh, it's developing content in new domains, and that's why uh, we would like you to fill out these questionnaires to see which domains that we uh, need to be thinking about and supporting at InterSystems. It's improving support for application using multiple fire uh, uh, releases simultaneously and multi-language support. And it's adding facilities for migrating data to and from V2 messages and CDA documents. We are also at InterSystems looking at fire as a data model because it's a very rich model that has a lot of uh, good semantics around defining things like code value sets and open value sets that correspond to well-recognized uh, and adopted terminologies such as RxNorm, SNOMED, LOINC, et cetera. Uh, every, uh, it, I don't know if any of you saw my talk on fire analytics, but the idea is that we could capture a lot of fire data in the form of tables it does take additional work to mine these tables, but it's, it's certainly possible to do uh, with uh, IRIS. So further development on FHIR, there's going to be a lot of uh, interesting things that can be uh, improved and extended, such as smart app launch, so we can connect third-party applications to electronic health record data and allowing these apps to launch from inside or outside the user interface, these applications would communicate with their EMRs to get data and then do uh, uh, display information. CDX Hooks is a RESTful API that can 
help us integrate clinical decision support in with FIRE. Uh, FIRECAST, uh, ability to synchronize different health care applications using FIRE in real time. CQL gives us the ability to express logic uh, using FIRE and queries. And then uh, something that I think uh, we have very many uh, clients that are interested in, bulk data. So an approach that we could export data, not just as a single request on a single patient, but for those that are pre-authorized to export many, many uh, different patients. So I'm going to turn it over now to my colleague, Max, who will give you a good use of its implementations. <clears throat> Thank you, Patrick. As Patrick mentioned, uh, my name is Max Vershinin, and I'm a sales engineer from the UK, although I don't have a typical British accent. And uh, in this part of our session, I will try to give you a brief overview of what is happening in the UK with regards to fire. Uh, you might have heard that in the UK we have uh, NHS, which stands for National Healthcare Service, and they introduce standards which have to be applied by healthcare organizations in the UK. And uh, basically, historically, NHS has been trying to uh, force uh, organizations to share data. There used to be a national program which failed. Then they tried to use uh, HL7 version 3, which also didn't to take off. But at this stage, NHS has fully bought into a fire. And most of the projects which are currently running under NHS uh, involve fire in some sort of shape or form. And they even extended STU3 uh, version of HL7 fire with KConnect uh, RESTful APIs and KConnect profiles, which are extending uh, STU3 fire. And there are multiple projects going on in the UK, like, for example, LICRA, which stands for Local Healthcare Record. And uh, within those programs, they have to share healthcare information using fire. And everybody who is involved in that project have to be able to consume and send fire messages. And if, for example, one of our clients, which is Leeds, they are part of that project and they're using Health Connect to do that. Uh, also, uh, NHS has extended, sorry, not extended, has created multiple APIs like uh, GP Connect, Transfer of Care, uh, Visitors and Migrants, FGM, and all of those APIs are based on FHIR. Uh, some trusts uh, also uh, decided to uh, basically do their own thing, and they are also creating a shared care record based on FHIR as well, uh, because they're not part of Lycra, they're doing something themselves. Uh, yeah, so we are working close with our uh, users and with NHS, and in this uh, session I'm going to cover three projects which we are involved in, and those are EMS, or Event Management Service, Transfer of Care, and GP Connect. And I just want to mention that uh, we are going to have a uh, demonstration of event management service later today in this uh, room. Uh, I think it's 4.30. So if you are interested to know more about this project, then you're welcome to join. So uh, yeah, in this part, I'm going to briefly talk about EMS, uh, which is event management service. And NHS Digital and partnership of organizations contracted into systems to be part of a first uh, kind of implementation of local event management service. And at the first stage, uh, this project is going to cover a uh, healthcare for children program, uh, which covers uh, the healthcare journey of uh, children from zero to five years old. And uh, during that healthcare journey for children, uh, they go through different events. Multiple events are happening like uh, blood tests, measurements, observations, etc. And there are multiple organizations involved in that. Actually, probably better to show it here. Mm -hmm. So there are multiple services are uh, involved in that, like GP practices, uh, national screening programs, etc. And lots of events are happening. And at the moment, actually, my, my children went through that. All of those events uh, would be going into physical healthcare record, which is a red book, 
and my wife had to carry that uh, physical book when they were visiting, when she was visiting specialists like GP practices or when they had to see consultants, when they had to see <coughs> pediatricians. So she had to basically, that was the source of the information. And uh, a lot of paperwork has been flying around and as a result, children were at risk of falling out of the system. And at the moment, this project is aiming so that all of those healthcare events would be uh, recorded into shared electronic, electronic uh, red book, which there are a couple of them available in the UK, but in this particular project, this is how it looks like. Uh, and in this particular project, we are working with SiteKit, uh, which provide that uh, electronic red book uh, nationally for some regions. Uh, on this slide, uh, you can see a brief uh, diagram or architectural diagram how it works. Uh, this uh, diagram evolves uh, because uh, more systems are being added as the project moves forward. Uh, it started with uh, just, uh, can I just use that? Okay, it started just with Amy's web, which has multiple uh, multiple products like child healthcare information system, uh, product for health visitors and GPs. Uh, we have a national screening service, which uh, basically uh, does, perform some tests and uh, blood sport tests, etc. And all of those systems are feeding into AMS, which is based on Iris for Health. Uh, and recently they have added also London system, uh, which serves uh, healthcare visitors, and it also sends uh, events which are happening to children through uh, Iris for Health, through AMS, which is then fed into eRedbook. Currently we support, I think, 37 messages, uh, and uh, it is going to be evolving. And as I mentioned, this is a first of type project, and once, once it has been deployed, then the vision is to use uh, that system for things like cancer, diabetes, end of life, etc. So it's kind of very important project for us and for NHS. Uh, yeah, so uh, in AMS, we're using Iris for Health, and the main thing is that we don't want just to process HL7, uh, sorry, fire messages. We also are using a fire repository to store subscriptions and to also have a cache of events because at the moment the idea is that if new subscriber subscribes to certain event or to get events for a certain child, then we need to be able to replay those messages so they can get up-to-date information. Yeah. <clears throat> and yeah, here it's, it's a little bit crowded slide, but I just wanted to show you uh, some examples. So for subscriptions, we support all fire defined uh, interactions like create subscription, search for subscriptions, delete subscriptions. All those subscriptions are stored as uh, resources in our fire repository and we support all restful uh, interactions which are uh, defined by <laughs> fire specification. Uh, yeah, this is how events are being sent. Again, you can see uh, interactions which are happening. Also, I forgot to mention that we are using uh, OAuth uh, to authenticate uh, all systems which are connected to us. And also, uh, we are being authenticated against OAuth token as well when we're sending events to our subscribers. So next project, uh, which we are working on is transfer of care. Uh, NHS Digital came up with a specification for transfer of care, which, uh, you, which is utilizing uh, Care Connect profiles, which I mentioned earlier. And at the moment, all transfer of care, uh, transfer of care basically at the moment happens using unstructured uh, document exchange like in PDF or HTML format. Uh, with this new uh, API, which is fully fire-based, uh, NHS uh, wants everybody, um, basically that transfer of care message will have structured and unstructured data in a single message. And they cover four use cases, discharge from inpatient care, discharge from mental health, discharge from ANA, and all patients' clinical letters. <coughs> 
all, all interactions are going to happen via mesh, which is a UK specific protocol which works similar to email. So you send uh, the message to a particular inbox and then it is picked up by the system or by a physical person from that yeah, yeah, mailbox. So here, I'm doing all right. So uh, here we have uh, a diagram how it works. Uh, we work together with two first of types uh, of trusts which are working with us and we have implemented, or I have implemented production which handles all transfer of care stuff uh, here. And as you can see, we have, uh, we provided an interface to the clients using two, uh, uh, two things. First of all, it is a RESTful interface, but they have a choice whether to send fire message to us or SDA, which is our canonical data format. And r the reason behind it is that not everybody can produce fire at the moment. And some organizations just don't have skill to produce fire at the moment. So we provide them with an ability to send uh, information in different ways at the moment. So uh, if they're sending it with SDA, we are just telling our clients that if a uh, version of Fire changes, then we would handle that for them. Uh, but this is how it works. And once we receive it, we do validation uh, because we have full uh, Fire data model within our product. So we can uh, check uh, the data that everything's fine, everything is present. And then we send a Fire message via mesh. Uh, as I mentioned, Mesh is asynchronous protocol and uh, we need to have an ability to uh, make sure that the receiving uh, party or system have received the message and that it has been processed properly. And because of that, we are also receiving uh, asynchronous acknowledgements, which are also fire-based messages. And there are two types of them. Infrastructure, meaning that the system has received it and business acknowledgement, which says things like this patient is not found or this patient is found on the system and everything is fine. So we receive that fire, those fire acknowledgements, uh, parse them, and then notify the caller <coughs> so they can do what needs to be done with this. Uh, examples, uh, as you can see, it's, is it? No, it's actually. I can see right here, but anyway, uh, yeah, as you can see, uh, I'm not showing the whole detail because the messages are huge. You can see this particular one. It's not that big, but it is like almost 1,800 lines. And you can see that there are multiple resources uh, which I <laughs> collapsed, uh, which are involved there. And also, uh, as I said, it contains structured and unstructured data. Uh, and uh, there is some mandatory data like medications, allergies, diagnosis, et cetera, which have to be uh, presented in that message. But you can see here uh, we are using a composition resource, which has all the unstructured data in uh, those messages. And the idea is at the moment GP suppliers are a little bit behind and they haven't uh, developed it properly yet. So uh, in this uh, screenshot, you can see uh, a viewer provided by NHS Digital, so you can upload transfer of care message and you will be able to see structured. And so here you can see unstructured, but you can click on a particular link here and see unstructured, sorry, structured data there as well. Uh, <clears throat> and here you can just open the same message in just in the browser and you can see human readable information there. Yeah, before I go into GP Connect, I just want to mention that with transfer of care, it is not optional for our trusts. They must uh, support it and the date is changing because different suppliers are behind the curve. But the thing is that I'm sure that next year all trusts in the UK will have to be compliant with that uh, transfer of care uh, APIs. So that's why it is kind of critical for uh, for trusts uh, to implement that. So finally, I want to quickly talk about GP Connect. Uh, GP Connect is also a new uh, set of APIs. Um, and uh, the idea is 
that historically, again, all hospitals, they were struggling uh, with getting information from GP practices. So they could see information which was on their system or in the hospital systems within the trust, but they could hardly access any data from GP practices. Uh, those who really wanted to access it, they had to pay for third uh, parties, for third party services to access it. And uh, uh, NHS realized the problem and they have introduced and implemented API, RESTful APIs uh, using FHIR. Uh, so now uh, you can access uh, GP clinical data uh, using different APIs. And in red squares here, I kind of highlighted APIs which we are currently supporting. Uh, the first one is access record HTML, and this is DSTU2-based FHIR API, which returns uh, unstructured uh, information, unstructured data, clinical data from GP practices in unstructured format in HTML. We also support access records structured. From the name, you can guess that this uh, RESTful FHIR API returns uh, structured data, and this one is based on SU3 uh, version of FHIR. And uh, the way it was implemented, it was implemented as Health Connect production, or we call them provider, and that provider can be used uh, by any client, but it happens that first of type for this project was one of our uh, HealthShare Unified Care Record clients, uh, which is Lancashire. Do I pronounce this right? <laughs> Lancashire. Anyway, so uh, they are uh, our HealthShare Unified Care Record user, and they are utilizing uh, our GP Connect provider to access uh, uh, GP clinical data. Uh, underneath, uh, our GP Connect provider is using different services like PDS, patient demographic service, which is not fire based, but you need to validate uh, NHS number, you need to get uh, information about GP practice. And then once it has been done, then we use fire based API to access data from a particular GP practice for that particular patient. This is an example of the request. And you can see that we provide NHS number, which is like social security number here in the United States. And we also define which uh, information we want to receive. Like in this case, we want to get allergies and medications. And here we have a part of the bundle which we receive back. And here I am highlighting how it is presented in our clinician viewer. But it doesn't matter what viewer you are going to have, you can use that provider to access data using FHIR, and once you have received back a bundle in the format which you want, like JSON or XML, you can then uh, convert it into human readable format. Uh, I think... Oh, Thanks, Max. Yeah. I think we're open to questions now. Uh, so if you do have a question, could you please go to the microphone and <laughs> we'll be happy to give it our best shot. <laughs> Just a, a real quick question. Mesh, is, what is the difference between that and email? <laughs> mesh is a, a, mesh, first of all, I had on my, on my slides things like, for example, Spine, and Mesh is implemented within, Spine is our, uh, our NHS uh, has M3 network, with, which is a private NHS uh, VPN, and Spine provides services on top of that. So Mesh lives within that infrastructure. And the main idea was uh, it wasn't, it was supposed to be a system to system, like email messaging system. It's not email. I mean, the idea is the same. There's a mailbox, receives messages, and then you can. It is in tone for the UK, yes. Any other questions? Yeah, uh, head to the mic. Okay, this might be a really stupid question, um, but because this is a um, for trial use, is there anywhere where we, we would um, expect to, to not see it in use because it's for trial use, or is that 
not really the, an issue. This has yet. to, uh, the designation trial use is really an HL7 uh, term. And this gets back to what I was telling you about uh, HL7's methodology for advancing a standard. It goes through a lot of different phases in development. And one of its first phases is draft usage. And then as that is clarified through numerous committee meetings, it reaches a standard of balloting where people say, OK, this is now available for trial use. It's not at a level of maturity, though, where they would say, hey, we could move this necessarily to production. Even though people may be using it for production, what they're saying is this standard may undergo further changes. And that might affect, if you're using it in production, it may affect then uh, your compatibility going forward. So as we go forward in the maturity model in HL7, we reach a stage where things, the rate of change is slowed enough and the usage is common enough that we get to a normative status. And that's where we want to be because then we could really rely on that as not effectively further change breaking the standard. So that's really, at, when you're at the level of a normative use of a resource, you really, I think, at that stage can say, yeah, this is, this is production grade uh, uh, in terms of the API. And fire is getting there. It is rapidly moving there. And so uh, I do feel like we're going to see many, many resources that have reached normative stage in the next uh, year. So the only risk right now is that there's potential change to those resource definitions. But yes. It's reasonable to apply it in a production y setting. Yes, of course. And, and uh, just to repeat the question, if you're using uh, a standard for trial use, can you use it in production? Of course you can. But it, you just should keep in mind that FHIR is uh, continually revising its standards. So you have to stay tuned. And of course, if you're using intersystems, we, we are constantly paying attention to what's going on with the uh, uh, HL7 FHIR committees. Any other questions? Well, could you use Mike? I've been working extensively with Fire 3 and RS Health 2019.1. And, and the direction of our company is to piggyback our uh, product line um, on Iris for health and its fire capabilities. I have run into some issues in okay. 19.1. Okay. Um, what is the system's intention um, in the rollout of successive versions of Iris for Health? Um, is the intention to focus on version three, SU3, um, and get that working comprehensively and and uh, uh, production quality, right? Um, or is there a move to uh, to implement version four? Yes. Okay. Good question. We clearly want to make every version production grade in the sense of if there are bugs that you're encountering, you definitely we encourage you to report them to the World Wide wide response center because we don't want any version to uh, contain any kind of defects. But at the same time, we have to constantly stay in tune with what's going on with fire. So we will be rolling out in 2020.1 a fire R4 base uh, spec. But that's not to say we're abandoning uh, DTSU-3 or DTSU-4, uh, STU-2. Uh, we, we will not abandon those standards, but we, we want to keep pace with where fire is going. In fact, I would like to see us uh, even uh, 
when Fire R5 is released to get a, a version out that'll be closer to its its release date. I don't know how feasible that'll be, but we we're we're constantly in touch with the standards. But in any way, if you have any problems with uh, anything that you're doing, please report that because we definitely pay attention to those uh, issues. I have a very simple request. <laughs> I have spent the last two days looking for the developer poll to deal with the fire. <laughs> uh, the I have some very specific things um, that I've been told by everyone. He is the only man who's going to be able to answer your questions. Uh, I cannot find this man. <laughs> really? Okay. Well, let's, let's talk after the meeting here. <laughs> I, again, I appreciate your attendance. Please uh, hand me these uh, questionnaires because it, it's really going to help us in the, our product planning. And thank you again for uh, coming. <laughs>